Ask the Messengers TV show is a TV show that educates, informs, and entertains our viewers on public health issues such as mental illness, suicide, addiction, illness and disease, COVID-19 relief, crime, domestic violence, homelessness, human trafficking, employment opportunities, health care, and more. And now, Ask the Messengers. Today on Ask the Messengers, we bring you another author series hosted by Kimberly Mallory. Kimberly's guests are Lakina Folks and Michael Constantine. Lakina is here to talk about her book, Why a Young Girl's Search for the Truth. And Michael is here to share his story of sobriety. Also in this episode, July is Minority Mental Health Awareness Month. And we bring you information that we hope will help break the stigmas associated with minority mental health issues and concerns that affect our families and our communities. Ask the Messengers begins now. This is Michael Constantine, everyone, and he is in recovery. He is a recovering addict, and I have him on my show today because of the amazing things that he is doing in his life. So first of all, what I would like to do is start out by just asking Michael a few questions just about himself so that the audience can get to know you a little more, Michael. Okay, so tell us just a little bit about your recovery. No, tell us about your drug use first. Tell us what it was, you know, using the alcohol, how long you were using it, and then let us know, you know, how much clean time you had. Um, I was using alcohol and smoking marijuana since I was 20. And I have um, been clean for about a year and a half now. Yes, yes, that is so awesome, Michael. So in your clean time that you have had, or even maybe when you were using drugs, prior to you using drugs, tell the audience um, some about what it was that you started doing when you got clean. Um, well, first things first, one of my biggest accomplishments is starting to write a book which I'm actually still working on. And then um, just, you know, redoing my whole friend group and my surroundings and then rewiring my mind to do better. So, Okay. Awesome. Awesome. You can elaborate a little bit more about what's going on with you because I'm sure the audience wants to hear. I want to jump back just a little bit, audience, because I want to talk to Michael about his drug use first because sometimes you have to go on this journey with us so that you can kind of understand sometimes some of the things that we go through while we're getting high and then sometimes the struggle of becoming clean. So Michael, share with the audience a little bit about, you know, that drug use that you had, you know, what were some of the things you were doing? How were you feeling when you were out there just getting high? Um, I'd have to say it was really, it was really a social thing. It's crazy how in America, how, how embedded it is in society to go out and have a drink to celebrate or go out to have fun. And then you really learn that you don't have to do those things to have fun, which is, which is the greatest part. Um, and then the people that I was around, that was a huge part, you know, your environment's everything, your environment's what's going to control your mind a lot. And if you don't control your mind, it's going to control you. So you need to have power over that. All right. Yes. So you said the environment is everything. Environment's so, everything. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. What, you know, what do you mean by the environment is everything? So who you're hanging around is going to have the biggest effect on your, your subconscious. So let's say, let's say you're hanging around a bunch of alcoholics, you know, and you want to hit certain goals. They're going to press you to go out and drink. They're going to press you to go out and distract you from your goals. But if you stay, if you really stay within yourself, and know yourself well enough to reach those goals, you have to separate yourself to elevate. So that's the biggest thing. All <laughs> right. All right. You better preach to these young people. Do you mind me asking you how old you are? I'm 30. 30 years old. And you started using alcohol. How long ago? How old were you? About 20, about 10 years old. Uh, not 10 years old, 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, 10 years ago. Okay, so you were in your yeah. 20s when you started using alcohol and you stayed out there, you know, continuing to get high oh, for those man. 10 years. Oh, yeah. It was like every single weekend. It was like a religious thing. You know, my buddies are going out. I'm going out. And then you realize once you become sober, how much money you spent, how much, you know, other things you could have invested in, how much better you could have spent your time. So um, 
that that's a big thing because you you always think about how much money you could have in the bank right now and well what else you could accomplish but you can't live in the past you know you got to live in the future now work for the future just better yourself that's all you can do Wow. See, that's so awesome. You know, when we were just talking about the environment that you're in, the reason why you do the things that you do is because of the environment as well. The people you hang around, the places you hang around, the things you do, and you want to be have that similarity with the people that you're hanging around. You know, there's an old cliche and it says, if you know, you'll tell yourself, oh, I'm not going to be like my friends. Look at him. He's an alcoholic. You know, we're going to judge that person. We're going to say, I'm never going to do that. But you keep hanging around that person. They have this cliche that says, if you keep going to the barbershop long enough, eventually <laughs> you will get a haircut. So, yeah. you know, that's so amazing that, you know, you, you telling the audience about how you can start doing the things that you're doing um, because of the association. So now tell us what you're doing now, now that you have this year and a half clean, tell the audience some things about what you're doing. Um, my biggest thing is just staying, staying uh, guided towards my goals. And I really got back to God over this time. So that's a big thing. And he's been helping, you know, without God, you can't really do too much, but with God, all things are possible. So, you know, writing a book is my, is my biggest achievement right now. And then working, building my clientele, just staying focused on everything, staying focused and staying in line. You know, you gotta have a, you gotta have a goal. You gotta have a goal. You gotta realize why you started what you started and why you gotta keep continuing what you're doing. You gotta say that again, say that again, Michael. Go ahead, can you say that again? You gotta continue doing. You gotta continue doing, just stay focused on your goals. Keep on keeping on, you know? Even if you got to take it day by day, a day will turn into a week, a work a week will turn into a month, a month will turn into a year. And before you know it, you're just rolling. That's right. You all hear that. You know, it is possible. Recovery is possible. You can make great things out of your life once you leave those drugs alone. Speaking of doing great things in your life, Michael has an amazing idea to just design suits. So he started creating just designs and the most of the suits that he wears, you know, I noticed that when I had met him that he had his name in his suits and I'm like, you go. I have never seen him all the time that I've seen him, not mentioning where I've seen him at, but I've seen him several times and he's always so very well kept because of the suits that he makes. So how did you even get into wanting to do design suits, Michael? So um, there was a store I was passing by. I was already in the suit game for, I'd say, about eight years. And there was a store I was passing by. And I always heard of this store. So I walked in, I'm looking at all the fabrics. And I tell the guy, yeah, it's my next goal to, um, to design suits. That was my next biggest goal. So he offered me a job on the spot and I took it. So from there, I built my clientele, started working with, uh, you know, some, some teams and, other people, you know, attorneys, lawyers, get them all fitted up and everything. Mm. So, you know, it's, it's, I feel like image has a lot of part, a big part in your energy throughout the day. So mm. how you carry yourself is how you feel. You know, your confidence, yes. you carry over, you do it because you like it. You don't do it because everybody else wants to do it. Oh, such wisdom, such wisdom. I feel the same way. How you look is how you feel. You get up in the morning, you don't want to do anything with yourself. You know, you kind of say, dog, am I depressed? I, I, I just, I'm just not. But when you put on something, and I'm not saying that clothes mean everything, because I remember when I first got clean almost 20 years ago, the first outfit I bought was from Salvation Army for $2. And when I say I thought I was a princess, when <laughs> I would put that dress on heading to church, because it made me feel so good to even think and look at myself in a whole different manner just by the way that I looked. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Okay. So now I want you to look directly in the, into the camera, Michael. And what I would like for you to do, these young people that are out here, maybe on alcohol or drugs, you know, doing what it is that they're doing, they need to know that there's a better way. Look into that camera and give the audience some words of encouragement. The biggest thing you got to know is that you are in control. A lot of people fail to realize that they're in control of their life and how much control we have. You know, you don't, you don't need a drink to have fun. You know, you, you, you were one day without it. You can do it again. It's no problem to do it again. You know, that smoking, whatever you're doing to so-called 
have fun. It's society's pressure on you to do that. That's the only reason it came about, because if it wasn't there, you wouldn't be doing it. Stay tuned for more of Ask the Messengers. Well, hello, 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 everybody. Look, I'm so excited. I am so excited. Cannot stop smiling about this amazing author that I have on my show today. And her name is Lakina Fox. Lakina, welcome to Ask the Messengers. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. Well, awesome, because we're excited to have you. So we're going to jump right into your book, because, look, I have so many questions that I want to talk to you about after reading this book. I mean, <laughs> this book was so powerful. Audience, the name of her book is Why? Why? A Young Girl Search for the Truth. I mean, that alone, that title alone, why? You know, because that's so many questions. We have so many questions in life that we ask. And to have a title of a book that says why, so... The book was very powerful as I read it. Your book mentions a lot about pain. It it talks a lot about the fear. You know, it talks a lot about the abuse. So your book is something that actually we've all, all of us, at some point in time in our life, have gone through that fear, that pain, that abuse. You know, some more than others. Some may not have gone through any of those things. But if you keep living, you know, some of those things will hit home. So what yeah. I want to ask you is, you started with those things at such an early age in your life. Can you tell the audience a little bit about how did this pain, fear, abuse start so early? And tell us the age that it started. Yes, yes, yes. Great question. So yes, the book, Why, um, it is my story of pain to triumph you know, as well. And so it started off at the age of eight years old. So that started off, it started off very young, um, being molested. And then that, that fear and all of the things that come along with that type of abuse, and then not telling anyone and growing up, hiding it inside. So yes. Wow. Okay. So Mm -hmm. you said that you were abused at such an early age if you don't mind telling the audience how are you abused well I was um molested sexually molested Mm -hmm. and it went on for I think till I was about 10 years old um Mm -hmm. and I hid it you know it was um me and my sister as well um we're 10 months apart and we just hid it. We didn't say anything, but I took the bulk of it because I was the oldest. And um, it it led me into a life of keeping things silent and keeping things closed. So as I grew up and other things began to happen, I kept silent about it and I didn't tell. Wow. So you don't have to really say um, if you don't want to, but when you say that it was you and your siblings, that leads me to think that this was a family member that was doing this to you children. And, you know, this happens more than people think, audience, out here in this world where family members abuse fathers, uncles, brothers. And don't get me wrong, sometimes it's the men that get abused in the, in the families as well, you know, and it's a stigmatism where we have to, you know, we want to keep it quiet or the first thing we'll think to ourselves, Lakina is, was it my fault? You know? And so we carry that guilt, we carry that shame. And that's something, that's the part where God comes in, you know, because we, we need healing from those things because we will carry those from our childhood into our adult life and the reason why I'm saying that because as I read your book you talk about even today your age and all these amazing things you're doing that we're going to get into even today some of those memories tend to surface tell us tell us about that yeah yeah so um every now and then you know it may be a uh, a flashback of things um and not just the molestation um being married at a young age because at at when you're sexually abused you know some young girls is is different for them some is 
closed off for me, I became a little bit promiscuous. Um, Mm -hmm. And so I became sexually active at a very young age because I had an urge and I needed to be, I needed it to be felt. So at a young age, um, that was what I was doing. And so um, I got pregnant at 16 years old and married at 17 years old. And so um, at that time, I be my abuse turned differently because then I began to be physically abused. Wow. So the abuse changed. Wow, wow, wow. Mm-hmm. And you yeah. know, those memories pop up in, in our lives because see, the enemy is still really, really busy. He wants mm-hmm. us to continue to remember those things that hurt us. You know, mm-hmm. those things that that causes us fear. He wants to bring that back so that he can steal our joy. Because, yeah. you know, once you are delivered from that, doesn't mean that the enemy is going to stop putting it in your mind or bringing you back situations or things that remind you of the situation that you went through. Because as long as you're smiling and you happy, he's like, oh, no, uh-uh, you're smiling too much. All that I don't had you go through, your molestation. Oh, no. I want you to feel that pain all over again. Yeah, yeah. But the good thing about that is that sometimes, this is just my opinion, audience, that sometimes when that enemy tries to bring us that um, hurt and that pain and those memories back again, I look at it like this. God could be bringing us back those memories to remind us that, hey, sister, daughter, you're not there anymore. And so you feel that joy all over again. Yes, God. Okay. That memory means I'm not there anymore. Thank you, God, for delivering me. So tell me, how do you feel, you know, when the enemy brings these things to you? And then here come God showing up like our hero to tell us Mm -hmm. we don't have to go through those things anymore. He encourages us. Yeah. So when when those things come up, I just say, you know, look, I'm an overcomer and I am free from that. I am delivered. I am healed from that. So anytime the enemy begins to try to come with um, his thoughts, um, you know, putting his thoughts, oh, remember this, remember that, I immediately just remind him of his future. And then I, you know, I, I sometimes get, get crazy with it, you know, because the enemy, he'll come talking and I say, he'll come talking with his stinking breath. And I just be like, look, don't talk to me back up. I'm only here with my father saying concerning me. And, and I, and I'll say once time, you know, the enemy was just like, oh yeah, this, this and that. And I said, look, Mm -hmm. you with your dumb self, you got kicked out of heaven. Who gets kicked out of heaven? Who gets kicked out? You did with your dumb self. So don't come talking to me <laughs> trying to remind me of nothing. I'm healed, delivered, and I'm moving forward, and I'm going to help other women and young girls be free as well. Yes. And, 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 and the voice will stop. It'll silence. Yes. We have to silence his voice. Yep. Because we have to talk to him the same way we talk to God. We have to tell him. It's not, not today. Oh, yes, not, not today. today. We can't allow him to keep talking in our ear, you know? So yeah, we got to talk back. We have to talk, bring it. And I love how you talk about his speaking breath. You know, I love that. Yes, I I say all kind of crazy stuff to him (laughs) where it it, it just stopped. (laughs) If he comes talking junk to me, oh no, you better not come. Okay, so now, um, Lakina, listen, you, speaking of, you know, how you help the youth, you also have a business. So you're going to have to briefly tell us a little bit about this business. See where the enemy met for harm, God intent for good. So you took your trauma and made it into triumph and tell us about this business. Yeah, so it's called The Treasure Within, and it's a girls' mentorship program. And so um, the purpose of that is to inspire, uplift young girls, um, increasing their self-esteem, provoking them to think and knowing that their words can change their world, um, and just really giving them tools to be successful leaders and letting them know, like, just because something happened to you or your environment You do not have to be a statistic. You are not a product of your environment. You can change your life. And it starts with within. And sometimes young girls don't know really what they have inside of them because I didn't know. And once I found out, like, wow, I'm like, every woman needs to know this. They need to know that they're a queen, that they're beautiful. But when you have people that's in your life and they are constantly telling you you're stupid, you're dumb, you're ugly, you're nothing, 
you you will believe that, but you need to have a voice in your life to tell you the opposite. And so I want my mission is to be that voice into other young girls' yes. lives for them to know, like, hey, you're a queen, you're beautiful, you can be somebody. Just because this has happened to you, use that and help somebody else. Yeah. So, oh my God, how amazing that is. So yeah. what I would like for you to do right now is look directly into that camera. Mm -hmm. I want you to give some of these women out here, you know, and even some of these men, because they're probably men saying, oh my goodness, all yeah. that Lakina went through. God, I can't even imagine that being my daughter. So you are probably mm -hmm. talking to the men as well, but look yeah. into that camera and give us some words of encouragement. Yes, yes. So to all the kings and the queens out there, knowing that you are valuable, you are enough, you are worth something. You have treasures inside of you. There's hidden treasures and things inside of us. And the thing is that you just haven't tapped into it yet. Everything we need is inside of us. All we have to do is believe in God and believe in ourselves. There's so much power in believing. So no matter what anybody says about you, it's what you think about yourself. So you have to tell yourself that I am enough. I can do this. I am powerful. We are powerful. We are so amazing. And once we tap into who we really are, you'll see that you're unstoppable. You can do anything that your mind tells you to do. You just have to believe. Yes. So we're going to leave that right there with this powerful woman, Lakina Fox. We'll be right back with more of Ask the Messengers. Hello everyone and happy Minority Mental Health Month. People of color make up about 41% of the U.S. population, but can face more severe psychological distress due to different forms of racism and unfair treatment. Mental health doesn't discriminate and neither should access to care or treatment. That's why PsychHub created the Mental Wellbeing Resource Hub. To learn more about various mental health topics and diagnoses like PTSD, depression, or eating disorders, you can search for resources here. If you want to find out ways you can help with racial inequities and mental health, search racism in the topic dropdown. Thanks for listening. Well, that concludes this week's episode of Ask the Messengers. We also invite you to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and to subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you would like to help support our show, please feel free to make a donation of any kind by visiting our show website, www.askthemessengers.org. If you prefer to mail donations, please make check or money order payable to Ask the Messengers TV Show and send it to 18400 Schaefer Highway, Detroit, Michigan, 48235. Ask the Messengers is the program that deals with things that help you. Thank you for watching.